Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today it's time to dive back into non-metallic metal. Specifically we're going to tackle something that can be a little challenging and that is non-metallic copper. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V. So there's lots of recipes out there for non-metallic steel and gold and both of those have their own unique challenges. Certainly they can be tough to sell the non-metallic effect. That being said, copper is a completely different beast. Now, copper can have lots of different tones in it, but effectively it is a shiny red metal. That's really what's going on here. And coppers themselves, when we try to capture them uh, in our figures in non-metallic, can often be a little difficult to get because Red is very difficult to push into that broad spectrum. So today I'm going to show you on uh, this new Tomb King, uh, this awesome Tomb King from the, the new old world. He's one of the new sculpts from the old world. Uh, we're going to do him all in non-metallic copper. So I'm going to take you through basically the paints, the steps, everything I do to achieve a convincing non-metallic effect. Let's head over to the desk and let's get, let's, uh, let's get amongst it. All right, first off, the paints. So when it comes to the actual paints we're using here, it's funny because we're actually going to use something that we would largely think of, in some cases, as flesh tones. But we're going to start with this string of paints, going from these deep browns uh, for our shadows. By the way, the swamp brown is discontinued, but I really like it. Um, if you need something like that, you can just use Rhinox Hide in Citadel or anything similar, or Warm Brown in Pro Acryl, an excellent substitute for this. Um, and then we're going to use these different sort of pink, red, browns. And uh, our highlight will be this green color. Now, which is like a green gray. Why green? Well, because we do want to use something that will be complementary at the high end. We want to be able to kill the red out in the highlight. Just using white would only preserve the pink. By introducing green as our highlight, what we'll effectively do is counteract the red uh, in some small way and get a more neutral uh, light tone. But there's one more important paint here, and that is our turquoise. Uh, you know, we're not going to actually verdigree this, but just a little hint of this glazed into the shadows at the end gives just that faintest hint of copper. It sells the effect because we as humans associate copper so tightly with being verdigreed. I mean, think the Statue of Liberty, for example. Uh, the, there's just when you get that little bit of very light chromatic turquoise in the shadows, it helps sell the overall effect. All right. So on the model. What are we going to do? I'm just starting over black here. And I'll say when I'm doing non-metallics, I actually usually prefer to work over pure black. The reason for this is because non-metallics have very specific highlights and where they need to be placed. So a general zenithal, while good for things like matte cloth or something like that, doesn't really work well for non-metallics. So I'm going to start by just base coating the entire area in my darker brown color. And this is really not going to be a very big part of the scheme. We're going to leave a little bit of this showing here and there. Uh, but of course, uh, the goal is to um, basically just get down a tone that the rest of the reds will work over without issue. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is start integrating some of the two red primary reds I'm using. Now, I'm using uh, both this sort of fur brown as well as this more vermilion color. And I'm starting mostly with the brown. I know you're all going to want ratios. I know you all want to believe that this is like, do one drop of this and exactly one drop of this. It's not really that. I'm kind of using some amount and feeling out until I turn the brown slightly more red. So turn the brown slightly more red. Then I just simply apply this over most of the area. This is actually going to be, for the most part, my shadow tone. I will leave very small amounts of the uh, darker brown in the sort of downward facing recesses. Nothing upward facing. Everything upward facing gets covered because that's all facing towards the light. So even the shadows off the specular highlight will not be that deep. From here, my next steps are to integrate increasing amounts of that red and then eventually my pink color. So this is almost like a pinky skin tone. Again, if you don't have these exact paints, anything in this sort of range will work. Uh, you can use any sort of pinky skin tone 
and get to this place. And so I start integrating more and more of them in, building up a highlight. After two layers of that, uh, integrating a little more red and a little more of the pink, I then introduce, start introducing the green-gray. Now this is a really nice color in the mix and we start very light. It will not take much of this to make our layer lines really harsh because we're introducing a near white color so the layers will be sharper. So from that point I'm just still layering it up uh, until eventually at the tiniest dot and the very very smallest space I'm then going to go ahead and go in and put in a small dot of that pure green gray. Okay and once that's there, all of my general values are now in place. Everything I need to sort of sell the copper effect is there. Now, if you were just trying to sketch non-metallic copper pretty quick, you could just follow this progression going up from the brown, integrating the reds, integrating the pink, and then eventually integrating the green gray or a similar light value tone. And you're basically there. If you squint or hold it at some distance, you're going to get convincing non-metallic copper. It will look right because you have the correct value progressions in place. However, we're not going to stop there. Uh, we are, of course, going to go farther. So my next step is to begin smoothing all of this out. And this is actually a sort of back and forth process. So I begin by taking my pure red tone, which I've never used the pure red at all yet, thinning it way down into a filter. This is probably like four drops of water or five drops of water to one small uh, uh, drop of paint, something in that various area. It's very thin. And I'm going to then very lightly filter that over everything except the highest highlights. I do not cover the highest highlight areas, but I work around, try to smooth those layer lines with these thin filters. Now, that alone will just create a new edge of my color at wherever the edge of this filter is, but it will do a lot of work to do two things. Hide my previous sins of layer lines, which is great, but also it will reinstantiate the saturation of the copper. And that's really important. When we looked at those pictures of the metal at the beginning, you saw how there was a, there is that red tone in the mid-tone. It can be pretty intense. So we want to, it's not like bright saturated red, but it's red. And so we want to filter some of that back in, rebuild some of that saturation, which helps to sell the effect. One of the things that can often happen with non-metallic metal, since you have to run the whole value spectrum from very dark to very light, from 1 to 10, is you end up killing too much of the actual midtone. And non-metallics live in the midtone because the metal, the gold, the steel, the copper has some base tone, and if that isn't there and uh, showing clearly to the viewer, then all the value progression in the world isn't going to matter. My next step is to start glazing back and forth. So I start taking some of the lighter tones, which are very tough to glaze with, but we can do it. Um, we just want a highly pigmented paint, like these Fanatic paints, but AK, Pro Acryl, all of these are pigmented enough you can glaze with the lighter tones. It does still take some more practice, but it can be done. And now I'm going to go over the edge of my previous filter to again fuzz that line. And so we repeat back and forth, back and forth. You'll see me constantly adjusting here. The other thing I'm doing is always making sure I'm building in my bounce light. And in a previous video on non-metallic metal, I talked all about the placement of lights on shapes. But here, we've got to have our bounce light, our secondary reflection. It's never going to go as bright as the primary light, uh, but it is really important to have that secondary light there and present on the shape. That's ultimately what sells it as non-metallic metal. So not only do we have an extremely bright highlight on the side directly facing the light, but we have another one on the opposite side, sort of where the light would hit the ground and then bounce back and hit that. Now it's going to be dimmer, it's only going to be basically a mid-tone existing in the deep shadow area, but it will really help to sell the effect because we as humans are used to this bounce light being there and being on very shiny things, even if only subconsciously so. Once all of that's there, and there's a lot of futzing back and forth as far as smoothing and things like that go, I'll apply more filters of the red again, so I'm going back and forth a few times. 
really smooth, convincing non-metallic metal does take many different blends, and it's just a matter of working the surface in increasingly thin layers back and forth. Once that's all been done, it's now time to finally go to the turquoise. With the turquoise, um, we're going to thin that down to an ultra-thin filter. So this is like, I don't know, five or six or seven drops of water to one drop of paint, something in that range. Again, very, very thin. I'm always testing these on the back of my glove to make sure that they are extremely thin. And what I'm going to do is just sweep some of this into all of the deepest shadows. Now, the turquoise color, when it goes over top of the red, will create a nice, interesting transition into the shadow tone. And when it's in the brown, it will mostly disappear. But what we're actually doing is just introducing some chromatic tones to the shadows that create visual interest. It's hard. You're not really going to pick up on it from a distance. But when you hold the figure close, the shadows will be more credible, more compelling, and more visually interesting because of the additional chromatic hues that have been added into those shadows. So this little tiny touch, it doesn't take very long, but sweeping in this sort of turquoise color into the shadows uh, really does sell the overall copper effect by introducing the idea of verdigris into people's minds while simultaneously creating a much more interesting color palette that we're running through here. It's not all just in the reds. There's something else going on. This is also an excellent way to capture the cooler bounce lights and, and light that comes up uh, in the shadows. Uh, so just getting that, that sort of reflected light being in this turquoise tone is also very good. So there's more or less how he came out. I think he's pretty cool. Now, I will state at the time I'm recording this, I haven't finished all of the non-metallic yet, but you can see his sword is done. Uh, you know, the leg and the thing we're working on here is done. And uh, we're going to have some more things. I'll show you kind of where I got to in between recording this footage and now um, as well. Uh, it does take a long time. Like, I'm not going to lie. This is many, many hours of work to get it this smooth. Remember, you don't need to be this insane. The time is in the futzing and in the back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But really, if you stopped after that initial red glaze to rebuild the saturation, which could be pretty quick, you'd still have a very convincing and awesome non-metallic copper that you could use for your army or similar projects. Uh, so, uh, it's just a question of how much time do you want to invest in having a tiny 32 millimeter person have convincingly ultra-smooth blends. I'll let you decide what the time of your life is worth. So there you go. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you liked this, hey, give it a like. Uh, subscribe for additional hobby cheating. Don't forget we've got new videos here every Saturday. If you've got any questions I didn't answer, drop those down in the comments below. Always read every comment and answer every question I get. If you want to support the channel, there's lots of ways you can do so. Not only can you like, subscribe, and share this, but also you can pick up your hobby products at links down below. There's Amazon links down there if you're picking up anything. There's a monument link down there to pick up some uh, awesome new paint for yourself with a discount code. Um, also, there is, of course, our Patreon. And that's focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.